my effort at critical thinking, my, the one time I really tried to take a stab at Scientology before I got involved with it uh, was when I was a teenager and I had started high school and my friends were kind of ribbing me about my parents doing Scientology. And I was, you know, sort of like, yeah, I don't really get, you know, and they'd heard that, you know, this was in the, this is 1981, 82. Um, so my parents had, you know, my, my friends had sort of heard some things about Scientology. Maybe there was a 60 Minutes episode or something like that. And if you recall, at this time, Scientology was in the newspapers and Hubbard's wife was going to jail. I mean, this was a time when Scientology was not experiencing a lot of fun and games. And my parents were still diehard, you know, supporters. They ended up becoming collateral damage in a way um, of that whole mission fiasco that I sort of talked about uh, when we when we went through the the history of all this stuff. They were working at Pasadena Mission, and they ended up getting kicked off staff and getting declared suppressive for a little while uh, as collateral damage of this whole mission problem. But that sort of happened at a distance from me. I really wasn't aware of what was going on because I was a teenager. <laughs> I didn't care about anybody else but me. Right? So I was not paying a lot of attention to my parents' Scientology life. I still had a roof over my head. I still had a bed to sleep in. I was going to school. I was much more interested in trying to find a girlfriend than I was interested in anything having to do with Scientology. Um, I got some shit about it from my friends at school, I went and confronted my mom one day and I said, you know, hey, what's, you know, you guys pay an awful lot of money into the Scientology stuff and I don't really get it. Why, you know, couldn't we have nicer things? Couldn't we have a nicer life if you guys didn't spend so much money on this? It seems like a crutch, you know, that you guys are using. And that was the most bold criticism I'd ever offered on Scientology as a child, right? I was probably 13 or 14 at this point. And my mom sort of put me in my place. She was like, well, look, you know, we're your parents, we're adults, we get to make decisions, you're still growing up in our house. And so you've never wanted for anything. You've always had food, you've always had clothes, you've always had a bed to sleep in. So it's really not up to you to question how we spend our money. It's our money. And that was it. And I was like, okay, I have now been put in my place, you know, pretty rational response, really. My mom didn't like, you know, she, she, she was a pretty reasonable person in, in many ways. So, um, so that kind of nipped any kind of criticism of Scientology and, and their spending habits right in the bud. And I never questioned that again. But the following year, I might have questioned it more and I might have gone in a whole different direction, except this conversation happened one fine day in the summer between my sophomore and junior years of high school. I was hanging out at home. I had friends. We did role playing games. We hung out. We went to the mall, that kind of stuff. And my dad said that there was, uh, my dad had started his own company with another Scientologist as a partner, and we had, we had moved up to Santa Maria, California, which is outside of Santa Barbara. And, um, and so we were living up there now, and I was going to high school, and my uh, dad said that another person at the company who was looking into Scientology was going to be going to the Santa Barbara church, the ORC. And uh, would I like to go along to check it out for myself? You know, would I like to go see what the Scientology stuff is really all about? And since it came from my dad, I didn't really feel like I had the ability to say no. I was a little, you know, uh, whatever of my dad. And again, not because he was ever physically abusive or weird to me. It just, I just kind of had this deference to the things my dad wanted. So, um, so I went, you know, I went down to the church. I fully expected, you know, I took books with me. I took a backpack with games and stuff. I fully expected it was going to take me 10 minutes. I was going to blow it off and that was going to be it. Instead, uh, I went in there and I did the personality test, the Oxford capacity analysis, this 200 questions of yes, no, maybe. And, um, and I got this graph telling me all about myself. And I had this woman sit down with me and interpret my graph and go over my graph with me. And she, uh, I've told this story so many times, I'll just kind of cut to the chase and say that um, she convinced me that I was a shy, introverted 15-year-old, uh, which I was. <laughs> and so 
she kind of nailed me on that. And I thought I had been keeping that a pretty closely held guarded secret. And nobody really knew how shy and introverted I was when obviously everybody knew. And, uh, and so I signed, she said, we have a class that you can take. It's a communications class. And if you take this class, you will not be shy and introverted anymore. And you will be able to get dates with girls. And I said, sign me up, you know, take my money, shut up and take my money. Right. I couldn't sign up fast enough. And of course, let's remember that I went in there with this sort of surface attitude of I'm going to brush this stuff off. But at the same time, I want to acknowledge that I had been primed for this my whole life. So I didn't really go in there with a neutral attitude about Scientology. I'd had my friends ribbing me and giving me some shit about it. But I also had been raised with this stuff. So I had this idea that Scientology actually did work and actually was true. I just wasn't sure if I wanted to spend my time doing it while I was in high school when I was more interested in girls and stuff. So it was really a matter of more of priorities with me than it was a matter of I was critical of Scientology or I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I go in and I, and I get convinced very quickly that I should be doing Scientology. And I then wanted to sign up for classes right away. And I ended up borrowing money from my parents. They would not pay for it themselves. They said, okay, well, if you're going to do it, you know, we'll lend you the money, but you have to pay for it yourself. And I borrowed $900 from them so I could do three classes. And 900 bucks to a kid in high school who's working at Burger King, you know, that's a lot of money. Uh, but I went, I was really convinced. I mean, I should kind of tell you how convinced I was, right? That this was like the shit and I wanted it now because I wanted dates with girls, damn it. You know, and I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to get along in life better because I didn't like being introverted. I didn't like being the guy who got picked on at school. I didn't like any of that. And this was a possible solution to all of it in one go with a class. I was like, God damn, absolutely, I want to do that. So, um, so I started doing classes at the, at the Santa Barbara Org, and I went with this guy who would drive me. His name was Doug. And he and I would go down, and we worked together on the classes, and I did the communications. I did this very advanced communications class. I didn't do the entry-level one. I ended up doing the big one. And then I did a study class where I learned sort of in a codified form all of that study stuff that I'd grown up with, you know, learning to look up words and, and all the other aspects of, of Hubbard's ideas about how to study stuff. And I took a class on that basically surveyed the basics of Scientology because I didn't know all those basics. I hadn't read any of the books and stuff yet. I just knew what I had grown up with and what my parents had passed on to me. So, um, so I started taking these classes, started going back to school started looking a little better. But communications wise, I learned how to look people in the eye and I learned how to talk to them and I learned how to listen to what they were saying. But it didn't really help me get any more dates. <laughs> it didn't really help me overcome all the other cultural and social problems I was having. But I kind of convinced myself that it did because at least I was able to ask girls out now. You know, they weren't saying yes, but at least I could ask, right? So I consider that a big momentous kind of gain, right? And this is the way that we sell ourselves on these groups is we're promised the sun, moon, and stars. We don't actually get the sun, moon, and the stars, but we might get something. We might get a little glimmer of sunlight. We might get a little tinkling of a starlight or something, right? You get my analogy. And we buy into that as an acceptable product of our work and our money and our time. And we continue going with it on the promise or the hope that the sun, moon, and stars will eventually manifest themselves. And that's, that's how all these cults work, is they drag you in with these amazing promises. And they do give you something that you think is substantive and is very, very helpful to your life and changed your whole world. Well, the ability to go from not being able to look at girls to being able to ask them out, yeah, that was a good thing. But that was it. That was all I got for 900 bucks. 